Welcome to the We As Nature podcast, where inspiring visionaries share their personal stories of living in alignment with the more than human world, and how this informs their unique contribution to cultivating a flourishing future for life on Earth. Each month, We As Nature features a new storyteller, sharing their experience of how listening to and learning from diverse forms of life has altered their course. The power of story lies within each of us, offering a portal to the language of the heart, connecting us to our feelings as a source of inspiration and courage from which we can act. For those of us seeking to create a flourishing world, starting right where we are, these We As Nature stories offer a space to listen, contemplate, and envision new possibilities. We As Nature is brought to you by Flourishing Diversity, And you can find out more about who we are and what we do at the end of the episode, as well as in the show notes. In this episode, we are joined by painter, poet, and honorary president of the Black Environment Network, Judy Ling Wong. Judy takes us on a visceral journey from her childhood in Hong Kong in the 1950s to cosmopolitan London in the 70s, sharing how her experience of living in diverse cultures has informed her relationship with the natural world and steered the direction of her artistic life. For 27 years, Judy was the UK Director of the Black Environment Network. Established in 1987, this organisation has championed multicultural participation in the built and natural environment. As a major voice on policy and practice towards social inclusion and a visionary advocate for diversity and equality, Judy has received numerous awards and acknowledgements, including a CBE for services to heritage. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Judy to share her profound and fascinating story with us. Before she begins, we will leave an intentional 10-second pause. This is an opportunity to settle into your surroundings, observe your breath, and become aware of your contact points with the chair or ground beneath you. Begin to drop your awareness from your mind down into your body as you move towards a space of listening. The story I tell comes from a very early experience when I had not left Hong Kong, a small child growing up in Hong Kong. I'm about to turn 72, so you need to take yourself back in time, away from all those pictures of glitzy Hong Kong as an international centre, because it wasn't there. The place I grew up in was a place in which, at that time, people were pouring across the border into Hong Kong because they knew it was British, running away from the chaos of Mao's China. Hong Kong used to be an island that was barren with about 200 fishermen. But it was lost to Britain because of the Opium Wars. The Opium Wars were about British assertion that is thoroughly legitimate to see opium as a commodity. So why shouldn't they sell it to the Chinese? They grew opium in India and flooded China with opium, starting to undermine society with this drug, and the Chinese wanted it to stop. So at one point, the Chinese burned a huge load of opium, and that was the trigger for the Opium Wars. If we look back at the history of Britain, the use of force was a major thing in dominating the world where there was trade or colonialism, and they claimed the right to continue to trade in opium by winning the opium war. As part of that, 
Hong Kong was ceded to Britain. And why did they want this funny little barren island? It's because it has one of the most deep and remarkable sheltered harbours in the world when there were no planes. It was all about liner, ocean liners and big ships and so on for many, many years. And they used the port of Hong Kong to continue to import opium into China. Some of the changes with Mao's chaos and so on, people used to think, oh, why would you go to such a place? There's nothing there. But the chaos, it was somewhere to run and there was no border. Because before that chaos, people sort of didn't really want to go to Hong Kong, so why do you even need to build a border? But the people pouring across the borders, Hong Kong then had the first border in 1949, the year I was born, with what is so-called the Bamboo Curtain. And of course, the people pouring into Hong Kong, they brought the culture with them, an ancient culture. It was mystical. I grew up in a world in which everything was alive. Everything. Not what you just call living things, meaning that it grows. A rock was also alive. It had its own life. A rock might be part of a mountain. It might disintegrate and become part of soil. It has a life. It can live and die as a rock and become something else and still alive. So the story that I tell you has a context within which my experience was allowed. Children have such intense experiences. Many would have had experiences like mine, but in your scientific culture, with this bleakness of boundaries, would it be allowed? Would a mystical and aesthetic experience be rubbished and the young child would not retain that intensity and just let it go, forgotten, as they grow into adulthood. So there I was, this small child, and the circumstances was that I was a very ill child. My parents had run from China, struggled with having food to feed the children. No contraception. The woman kept having children until the children began to die. Because after all, children take their flesh and bone from the mother and they get weaker and weaker. The child born before me died. So did the child born after me. She also died. And when I survived as a very frail child, they thought I was the last child and treasured me because of that privilege of being the last. But it was not true that I was the last. So being so ill in my early years and the adult struggling to, erupt, to uh, survive, very often there was nobody in the house when I was ill in my bed. I was left with some food. That was it. I was all alone rattling around in this house with a garden. And sometimes I would go into the garden. Hong Kong is a subtropical country. It can get very hot. It can have blazing sunshine. It has tropical storms every day at the same time at noon, followed by brilliant sunshine. In summer, a steamy place. So when I went into the garden, against the back of the garden was a little cliff, not very high, but about 30 feet because the house was built cutting into the side of a hill. And against this little piece of 
cliffside. I called it a cliffside because this is a small child. It was so high to me. It was a row of trees that we call flame of the forest. Why were they called flame of the forest? Because the flowers come before the leaves. Bright, fiery, orange, red. And if you had a forest of them, they would look like the forest is on fire. And this row of trees was against this little cliffside, running into it, arching and running into the cliffside. It created a tunnel. It was dark under these trees against the cliffside. And it dripped with water. Moist darkness. And when you go into it, the cliffside was covered, completely covered in the most delicate ferns, soft, dark and green in the darkness. And when you look at the sun, from this darkness, through those trees, especially when the flowers came out, you saw a dazzling sunshine in between the glowing flowers, resplendent with the sunlight in orange and red. And I repeatedly went alone into this space. And there, one day, as I usually do when I'm in the tunnel, I usually run my hands across the ferns. They were so soft. It was like the fur of a cool, moist animal. And as I did that, immersed in the moist darkness, with the filtered, dazzling light between the red, I felt myself dissolve into the ferns. I was no more. I was inside the ferns. I, the waving, gentle ferns in the darkness. How long did I stay like that? Maybe not very long. Long enough However, to feel it was an eternity in the cosmos of moist, living, waving, moving ferns. This is the experience that marked my relationship with nature. I was at one, not just notionally, but actually, and my culture allows it. I can do this in this mystical, ancient world where everything is alive and interpenetrable. I can be this. This experience is labeled real. So I carried this experience undamaged by cultures that might deny its reality. Like I did not speak of it to others in my culture. It was mine alone, carried intact into my life. As I grew, I wandered because I was displaced from Hong Kong to Australia, Australia to Europe, living in West Berlin, and then coming to London. Sometimes people read my travels and think it is very glamorous without realizing that it was because I had no right to stay anywhere until I finally escaped back into that British colonial identity and came to my so-called mother country in the UK. 
To my surprise, when I came to London, I liked it, and I stayed. And multicultural London has been my home since 1974. So everything is marked by this experience. I came as a poet and artist, but I was lonely with the Western mode of artist, individual. And original. I was trained as a Chinese traditional artist and declared a professional when I was twelve. And it was a communal framework of artistry. Artists would gather, for example, regularly in cafes, and a huge piece of rice paper would be put on the wall, and we painted communal compositions. As an expression of our continuity with each other, so I was lonely, and I began to do something in which I could connect with the community. So part of my work became as a community artist, and that was when the die was cast for my becoming an environmentalist. I connected with ethnic minorities in that communal work, and I identified with them. Because we have common journeys of displacement and suffering, and when the time came, when I ran into that group that began questioning the whiteness of the environmental sector, we were to become the steering group and found the Black Environment Network. When I was a community artist, we always asked the community what they wanted to do. As a project, surprisingly or not, they kept saying the environment as a theme. So things were coming together, and as I grew in age into my thirties and was finding my social commitment, I decided to abandon the arts altogether. I wanted huge change. The arts were not fast enough for me, and yet. I was carried by creativity. My friends were shocked. They said, "You're building up your artistic career. How can you suddenly abandon it and be environmental?" I never had a problem. I always recognized that to just hinge artistic existence on the creation of saleable artistic products was limited. Everything is created. I go by what Joseph Boyce, the artist, says: "Everyone is an artist. Creativity is in all of us. The artist might be at the pinnacle of creativity, but we can use creativity through process to connect and awaken everyone's creativity and change the world. And throughout all of this, this intensity." Of identification with nature, the intense impulse to protect what I love and what I am continues to be a major underpinning essence of all that I do. Thank you for listening. A huge thanks to Judy. You can find links to her work in the show notes. After Judy shared her story at the live We as Nature event, she offered a question for self-reflection, which is where we will leave you today. In your experience, how have cultural norms been a barrier or facilitator of deep experiences with nature? We hope you enjoyed Judy's story as much as we did. See you next time. The We as Nature podcast is recorded live during an online gathering, where each month a new guest shares their story, and attendees enjoy the opportunity to connect with other listeners. You can find a link to our upcoming We as Nature live events, which are free to attend, in the show notes. We as Nature is brought to you by Flourishing Diversity, an initiative bringing together voices from all over the world to explore humanity's interconnection with the lands, waters. Forests and fellow species. Flourishing diversity is a path towards a vibrant future 
and offers a collective approach in response to climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. We create spaces to listen to and learn from all life, raise critical questions, search for alternative answers and amplify generative biocultural practices. You can register to receive updates and inspiration from us at flourishingdiversity.com as well as finding us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for being here and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thank <laughs> you.